so I'll uh, say, first of all, uh, my thanks to everyone uh, for coming along and uh, see many friends from around the world who are actually here in Zoom, as well as uh, my friends and colleagues here in Paris. So it's a huge honor to be able to have this chance to put some ideas uh, together, which have been fermenting for some time, as you'll see over, over many years, but uh, it's good sometimes to take a step back and put them together. And it's a, an honor and a wonderful opportunity to be able to do it here. So anyone who has read the Bible knows, you know, in the beginning was the word, but it leaves a, a big question open, like which sort of word? Is it just logos? Or if we uh, go into other languages, what do those words look like? And uh, that immediately brings us to the questions of diversity, of differences across languages, which will be the theme of these four, four lectures and of how we are to confront it as a discipline, despite what uh, Amina said in the introduction that, you know, languages are too important to be left just to the linguists. Uh, I have said that in the past, but I think it's because linguists have been taking a very dull approach to the question. And I think if we take a more interesting approach and uh, along the lines that I'll be advocating uh, in, this, in this course, uh, diversity assumes center stage and becomes much more interesting. So the immediate first question is, well, how deep does it go? And I think it's sort of helpful. Like if you just ask the person on the street, maybe not uh, you know, someone in this room, uh, but maybe someone in this room after all, and say, well, just name two languages that are very different. Uh, people are quite likely to say, oh, well, English and Chinese, for example, right? And have some sinologists and Chinese speakers uh, here in the room. Uh, so let's just line up three languages instead of two, uh, French, uh, so if we look at the structure of, of French and Chinese in this example, I'm just going to look at numerals as, as one example, uh, one tiny subpart of language. Uh, we can see that the structure of English and Chinese is almost identical conceptually. What I have left out here is that the, the special words, which are the fourth and eighth powers of 10 in, in Chinese, so 10,000 and 100 million. Uh, but apart from that, in both uh, languages, you can see I've just put in sort of blue colouring the sweet spots, as it were, that is the numbers that condense uh, a number like 100 or 1,000 and, and so on into a single lexeme 10. So that you can see that in French, say, so on, uh, Chinese equivalent, and French dis and, and mille and so on, uh, exactly the same. Whereas if you take a number like 36 in French, 216, or 7776, which seem like complicated numbers in French, and you can see from the characters in Chinese also uh, com equally complicated there. Uh, but you look across to Nen, which is a Papuan language of Southern New Guinea, and you will see that I've put now in green the sweet spots in Nen, come in at pus, which is six, uh, and then perta, which is 36, that is six squared, and at taromba, which is 216, that is six to the power three. I've left out the six to the power four, but there's an equivalent one, domino, uh, and then uh, left out six to five, and, so, and then we go up to six to the five, uh, weremaka, which is 7,776. Now I'll say, more in a later class about how that seemingly weird system has arisen, but uh, it's just here for the moment to say, although we think about English and Chinese as very, very different, in that, I'll, I'll use this term design space, that is the space of possibilities, either for languages as a whole or for features of a language, uh, English and Chinese cuddle up very close together. And uh, sorry, and French and Chinese, it doesn't matter. And of course, they're all on the Eurasian continent. They've all been uh, in contact you know, for a very long time. There's lots and lots of similarities in time reckoning systems, uh, in words for certain uh, types of 
cabbage tops and everything. So uh, we shouldn't really uh, fall into the trap of thinking that just by looking there, we have fully sampled the world's diversity. As we will see in this course, we can very rapidly go much further. And that's what we will do now, as soon as I can work out how to work on Nina's computer and activate these. Okay, so that is uh, some of the tones in Chatino, which is uh, a language spoken in Oaxaca, and that is Hilaria Cruz, who's the native speaker and has done a lot of really fascinating work uh, along with her sister, Emiliana Cruz and, and Anthony Woodbury, who have worked on the tonal analysis. And this is a language which according to whether you, depending on whether you include Sandy, uh, tone Sandy effects or not, has somewhere between 12 and 16 phonemic tones. So again, uh, you know, we might think of you know, Chinese or Vietnamese or something as tonally complex, but that's just in kindergarten. Uh, compared to what you get here. And what's really interesting about Chatino is that there are even varieties of Chatino with no tone. And so, so you can look at the whole complex process of tonogenesis here. Uh, and uh, it, it could even be argued if you're adventurous that you can have a monosyllabic polysynthetic language that you, you just start off with a multisyllabic word with a lot of morphemes and then you just scrunch them all down onto the tonal system. So these things, um, are, you know, including a lot of morphology. And I well remember that Hillary, who's here today, uh, gave a, a really lovely plenary at the, um, at the ALT meeting in Canberra back in 2017, arguing that should we always see um, some Sino-Tibetan languages as, as um, analytic and that really depends on what you take as your units. Once you peek under the tones and tonal contrasts, you, you can identify morphemes there. So I'll just, just to play you a couple more examples. Okay, that's enough to get the idea, right? That uh, that's just one data point among the world's uh, seven and a half thousand languages, uh, and if we just go in with our ears and, and compare this to, to French or, or to English or to uh, uh, a click language of Southern Africa or to an Australian language with all its nasal contrast, whichever way we listen, we will be encountered with, an, we will encounter an incredible diversity in the sound system. I like to begin with sound because there's less pushback from people who believe in linguistic universals, because really the, the hill which they are wanting to die on is the hill of uh, syntactic organisation. So they're willing to sort of concede the outlying borderlands of um, phonology on the one hand and semantics on the other, like the numeral systems. Well it's, well, it's just a numeral system. Numbers aren't even really a part of language. You can have numbers and just make some marks on a pot or something. Uh, so. Well, I'd like to go a bit more. I, I'm sorry, this slide will be a bit hard for you to see if you're here in the room, uh, just to make the point that this diversity cuts across all levels of language. Uh, so if we just begin with one word, which is appropriate at, at the Sorbonne, the word for, for not to know. Uh, so that's, again, one of 
100,000 words or so or vocabulary in, in, in a given language, but it's a very revealing one. So if we just think of English, uh, no, and then French, savoir, and Russians, not, and, and Japanese, shiru, and uh, Mandarin, jida, uh, and teri in Tamil, mungaru in Kairuk, and bengan in, in Dalaban. So the last two being Australian Aboriginal languages. Uh, that is eight languages we've got there. And each one of those I've chosen to show something a little bit different. Very obviously, the sounds are different, and I, I personally think we shouldn't just discard writing systems. I know that the tendency is to think of writing systems as peripheral to a language, but they often do reveal things as well. Uh, but if we take them together, uh, pretty well all of these are very, very different, except that there are a couple of just hidden common inheritances not very obvious, but English no and uh, Russian znat uh, 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 um, cognate. So the, the what would have been the k pronounced kno when people used to say it that way in English, and the the palatalized z from a k in in Russian. That's a k which gives something away. And I'm pretty sure that konet, if we go to that word in French, is, is also. Uh, cognate with that. So there we've got a little bit of shared inheritance and there's a little bit of horizontal transfer that is borrowing just in the sign system from Mandarin into Japanese for the first of the two graphemes in each case. Even though the Japanese word is not cognate with the, with the Chinese word um, because Japanese adopted uh, originally its writing system from Chinese, it took on board the Chinese, Chinese word. So there's a little bit of similarity, but you know the very obvious thing, which isn't controversial for anybody, that um, you know words are different, they sound different, they're written differently, uh, and then there's all sorts of types of sound difference. We've already seen this with our Chatino example, but only Chinese has tone in this little eight language sample. Uh, only Japanese really has pitch accent. Uh, palatalized consonants are only found in, in Russian. The retroflex j, at least in this word, on, only, um, only Mandarin has retroflexion, although Dalabon and Kaido also have it not uh, shown in this particular word. So there's sound differences uh, there as well. Uh, but there are also grammatical differences. And if we all know that language is basically a system for mapping between uh, form, uh, either sound or some visual thing, if it's a sign, sign language, and meaning, and the morphosyntax, the grammar, sits in the middle as some sort of bridging or, or mapping device. Uh, and that's where proponents of a less uh, diversity oriented view, let's say, have staked out their territory. Uh, but if we look at the grammar of these words for no, there's already quite a lot that's different there. So in terms of combinatorics, uh, if we just look at the English, French, Russian examples or, or Japanese or, or Tamil, those are all verbs, but it doesn't have to be the case that all languages lexicalize that concept as a verb. And in kaido, mungaru, it's actually an adjective. It's interesting, like, so in French, you've got the antonym pair, savoir, ignorer, both verbs. In English, what's the, there's not really a verbal opposite of no. You know, you'd probably say to be ignorant or, or else say to not know. Uh, so we have a skewing across word classes there. Uh, in kaido, both are like the ignorant in English, that is probably you would want, if you want to tr capture the meaning through your word class in your translation, you would say that mungaru means knowledgeable. But I'd be more inclined to say it means no, but it has the combinatorics of uh, knowledgeable. So it's definitely an adjective for reasons I, I won't go into, just take my word for it or read 500 page kind of grammar. Um, and then argument structure. Well, in uh, English and Russian, etc., it's a transitive verb. Uh, 
and the knower is the subject. But in Tamil, it's uh, the is it a subject or not? There's been a lot of ink spilt on that debate in Dravidian linguistics and elsewhere. But at the very least, if it is a subject, it's a dative subject. And, and maybe you would just want to say it's some sort of experiencer so that it means uh, something more like if you say Kumar knows this place, it's something like to Kumar this place knows or to Kumar this place is known or translating it something like that. And then the morphology is also different. So that in Chinese, it's just an invariable uh, word. At the other extreme in Dalaban, which is a polysynthetic language, uh, you just don't get to use the word bengan on its own because you can't just use a verb. Well, it's already inflected for the present tense with the N on the end, but you can't just use that on its own. You've got to put on the various prefixes and you would get a word Admittedly, this is at the more complex end, but it's perfectly legitimate uh, Dalabon word, Bengan. So, and you would translate that into English as then you and I, who are in odd-numbered relations to each other, recognise whose spirit it is. So you've, you've built up quite a complex uh, expression in terms of meaning uh, into a single word. And then the meaning of these words, although we've lined them all up as no, just as we do if we make a nice you know, basic word list or something and ride roughshod over the semantic differences, but there are some very real and interesting semantic differences here. So we know uh, that, for example, savoir and, and no and znat are not good translations of each other really precise translations because in English no can translate savoir or can translate connaître. Uh, so that's not a difference that's readily available in English. We have to add in some additional uh, paraphrase and then in Russian as well as znat you've got umit which doesn't correspond to connaître either. It's more like to know how to, so procedural knowledge. So you've got sort of knowing facts knowing people or situations, uh, knowing how to, why assume those are the same thing. English does, puts them all together, but not all languages do that. And that also raises a question if we want to say, well, what's the real no? Uh, is there such a thing? Or uh, are these cuts different from language to language? Uh, then as well as that, there's questions about the temporal organisation of knowledge. So the Japanese word shiru is better translated as to come to know, to find out. Or something. But it's more than just finding out, but to, to learn about, to come to know. Uh, so if you want to say really to know, it would be more like shiru. Um, so there the, the skewing through time as between being in a state and assuming a state is different to what it is in uh, the other languages I've given. And then perhaps most profoundly uh, of all, uh, this is something where I've been locked in interminable warfare with Anna Vizbitsko and Cliff Goddard for about 15 years now, uh, trying in vain to convince them uh, that Dalabon, because you might know if you've looked at natural semantic metalanguage and theories of semantic primitives, they want to take no as a primitive, which it's a big problem for me because it's like which no. Uh, but Dalavon Bengan, I don't think really means no. It, it really is more like to think or have in mind. And the most telling thing about there is uh, I can't say in English, you know, I know John's outside, but he's not. You can't um, cancel the entailment of factivity that goes with no in English. But in Dalabon, I could say, I bengan, that, go, that John's outside. And then actually what I do is in the clause, which says that John's outside, I put in a little particle that means, well, someone thinks that's the case. Uh, so, well, especially if I say, you know, Hillary knows that, that uh, John's outside. So I say, Hillary knows, uh, Jet Ning, uh, uh, Jet Ning, John's outside. It would be a better translator as, Hillary is under the illusion that uh, John is outside. So it, it really focuses on what people have in their mind 
without entailing fact, factuality of the proposition in the way that English uh, no does. So uh, it's not a perfect uh, translation of no. And there's a number of other Australian languages which have the same sort of phenomenon there. Let's see. Those are just some little initial jabs, your first two shots of the vaccine, uh, to get us thinking what, what we're going to be talking about in the course. Uh, then we just looked at from these little initial points uh, are interestingly different. And I think, you know, every linguist will agree that there's a certain amount of difference from language to language, but I don't think linguists or linguistics as a field is at the point where there's collective agreement on how deep this goes, and then if it does go very deep, what we should do about it in how we conceive of our field. So that's the sort of big goal of these four meetings. So let's start with what we agree on before getting down to the more interesting questions of what we disagree on. Uh, so, well, I should say we sort of agree on the number of languages. There's lots of inevitable debates about, you know, do we count language where the last speaker died last year? Or how do you divide up, you know, dialects from languages and that sort of stuff? Uh, you know, a lot of questions like that. But I think people will agree that there's 7,000 and not 700 or 70 or 70,000, you know, so it's a, people agree on the order of magnitude. And then if you try and make calculations about how many there have been since humans began to speak, or maybe since hominins began to speak, that's a question, sort of when question, um, that we'll return to later. But we sort of agree on that amount, uh, given those nagging problems of delineation of units and range of variation inside individual languages and also superposition of languages in multilingual individuals. You know, like so, you know, if, I, if someone has a, their own personal repertoire of, you know, English, Zulu and Mandarin, uh, does that make them different in some way to, to someone who's in English, French bilingual? Uh, and that's a question I'll... I'll say a little bit about in the last um, meeting as well. Then there's another question, which is the number of maximal clades. Uh, I find this a useful term just because when you say families, some people get hung up on the difference between language families and isolates. And they'll say, you know, there's this 50 families and two isolates or something. Well, it really doesn't matter if something's an isolate or a family in terms of deep level uh, language diversity. So the idea of a maximal clade is it's just the, the largest grouping from one up to 1500 of, uh, for which we can securely uh, posit a, a common ancestor about which we know enough to sort of prove that there's common descent. Uh, and that sort of number, if we, if we look in Glottolog, uh, which is one of the few places that actually gives a number for this, uh, they give the number of 428. So we think of these at a current state of knowledge, we presume it's going to go down rather than up. I mean, we might discover a few more new languages which would push it up a bit, but it's likely that we will discover connections between some of these and I'll show you an example in a, in a moment. Um, so, but for our current state of knowledge, we assume that each one is a separate evolutionary development, or, or better said, a separate development for which we can say something, because presumably these languages all have common ancestors further back, but we just can't say anything about it. Th this is a really important because uh, when we sample and we it's very rare, I think, that in typology you can do good work with large samples because you, that will be shallow work. You, you would just have to say, for example, all those words for no, that's our word for no. So all of those other little things that I talked about, you'd have to sort of ride roughshod over. Um, but when we do sample, we say we said, well, we're going to take 10 or 20 or however many, we do not want to overlook the 
contingencies of the known. So that is, you get tra transmission of traits together and you think, oh yeah, this goes with this. Well, the reason it goes with that is it went with that further back in time in an ancestral state. Um, and that's uh, what's sometimes known as Galton's problem. I think I, think I mentioned that in a, in a later slide. That is, we have to make sure to get away from that. Uh, so uh, we want to sample out, out into the maximum level of diversity and the best way of doing that is to sample across uh, clades which are as different as possible. And I love this uh, quote from, from Marianne Methuen which is very much in line with my own view of what we should be doing as linguistics, as linguists that linguistic theory will never be moved ahead as far by answers to questions we already know enough to ask as it will by discoveries of the unexpected. So that's why I'm not a great fan of questionnaires. It sort of siphons our efforts in the directions of the known, the parameters of the known, away from the parameters of the unknown. Uh, so the, the nagging problem here is, is really, uh, I think there are a lot of unrecognized clades and our, that is groupings of clades uh, which we just don't yet have the methods to deal with or we do have the methods and we haven't applied them well enough. I'll say something about that in a little while. And then the third measure which I think everyone agrees on is the amount of structural difference at a shallow level. So when I say at a shallow level I mean the things that we measure in a database like WALS or GramBank or Foible, we can list some number of possibilities. What are the, how many phonemes does the language have? You know, what's the dis, what's word or does it have or, or whatever? Th that's a very easy jump to do that sort of thing. Not completely easy. So if you say SVO, you might say, well, what do you mean by S? It's an ergative language. Which one is it? Is it the O or the S? So they're, they're not um, really or uh, really trivial problems, but I'd say they're more tractable than some of the other problems that I'm going to be mentioning. So, but we can sort of enumerate uh, surface structural difference. Uh, linguists will often talk about structural diversity. Uh, some evolutionary biologists use the word disparity to distinguish that from diversity, that is, you know, numbers of languages or, or lineages or species and uh, genera and so on. I think that's quite a useful uh, word and I'll probably use it a bit more during this, this course just because I think it's helpful to introduce it into linguistics. Uh, but there's uh, some problems here. One, one of them I, I'm going to call the founder effect on the choice of variable. Now you're probably used to the notion of founder effects from genetics that is so you settle, settle an island from a, one canoe and you know, whichever genes were represented on that canoe are going to be disproportionately represented in the new population. Uh, and uh, if you think of how these typological databases grew, they started off with the questions that were especially of interest either for speakers of European languages or for languages that were known at the time of setting up the databases which is not an even playing field. And uh, f just because I come from having looked at certain languages, some of the things that I find most interesting about languages, some of the phenomena that I'm not even going to talk about in this course, but things like modal case in Kyadil, which is a way of showing uh, as a supplementary system of tense aspect mood shown by choices of case like suffixes after all the other cases, or a second case thing in kind of cases that go across a noun phrase but then convert every word they attach to into a verb, or you know, various sort of wild and wonderful things like that. They don't make it into the database because firstly they weren't known about, they weren't on people's radar, and secondly you probably know that Wiles was originally designed as a coffee table book and you know, nice fold out maps and maps don't look very good when they've got one point. Uh, you know, one point here and everything else is just blank or the same colour 
So there was a, you know, there was a, actually a focus on things which would have a sort of nice visual uh, distribution. Subsequent things like Grand Bank have moved partially away from that. But I think it's really important for us to remind ourselves that all of these typological enterprises carry the ghosts of the past in terms of what was known when they were designed. And if we are to fully contemplate you know, the full extent of language diversity, we have to overcome those biases. Okay. So those were, anyway, they, they were just some little small problems, but basically those, those are issues that we agree on. And let's pass to some things that we uh, don't agree on. And of course, the, the really big question is how different languages are. So on the one, in the one corner of the boxing ring, if you like, we've got people who say that languages vary uh, without limit. Uh, so already this was a live debate 160 years ago to the year. So Steintal wrote this, that you know, a universal grammar is no more imaginable than a universal form of political constitutions or religions or a universal plant or animal form. I really like that quote because I, I think it hits the nail on the head. Uh, the, the, what is a more widely quote, quoted version from Martin Juice is that languages differ without limit and in unpredictable ways, uh, which I think it actually goes a bit further than, than the Steintal quote and, and opens itself up you know, to falsification, but that's fine. You know, it's, it's the role of strong statements to encourage falsification. And I think it's worth just adding that quote from Stephen Jay Gould, who you will know is you know, one of the great theorists of, of evolutionary biology, uh, that variation its, itself is nature's only irreducible essence. When he means nature, he means biological nature, I think. Uh, he's not talking about subatomic particles or, or things like that. Uh, so, uh, it's you know view that's surfaced in biology as well as in uh, linguistics, and in the other corner of the boxing ring uh, are universalists. Um, I was going to put in a quote from the Port Royal uh, grammar because Chomsky loves to invoke this as his intellectual forebear. And he said that it was really, it, it, the, I'll use the English pronunciation, the Port Royal Grammar, that was the sort of where the idea of universal grammar came from. I'm not 100% convinced of that. So if there's anyone here who, who knows the, the, that grammar inside out, I'd be, I'd be interested in it. So it's a possible addition one could make. But here are some others. Um, so I'll, Jesperson quoting someone else. Uh, but, you know, yes, we a great linguist that one almost comes to believe that the norms of syntax are indestructible. So persistently do they reappear in unexpected places. Uh, and then, possibly surprisingly, Greenberg, who's often put in the opposite camp to, to Chomsky, but amid infinite diversity, all languages are, as it were, cut from the same pattern. So that's a very interesting uh, sort of have it both ways sort of quote uh, and interesting to know exactly what he means and then again now we've got Pinker saying according to Chomsky so uh, it's just uh, I think Pinker's um, version is slightly stronger so it's nicer to put here but Chomsky is certainly you know, well known for espousing this view a visiting Martian scientist would surely conclude that aside from their mutually unintelligible vocabularies Earthlings speak a single language. So here we are. So these are the sort of two poles of uh, views of you know, how deep the diversity really runs. Now, um, it's important to remember this really nice article by, uh, by Charles Hockett, 1958, poor old Charles Hockett was one of the great losers of history because his book came out just at the time that, you know, syntactic structures and so on was, were coming out. Uh, and he got gazumped and sort of relegated to the shadows of history uh, in linguistics in some ways. But I, I think that book is a very thoughtful 
one. Uh, and he talks about this set of what he calls design features. He's not using the word universals, but that all languages have, you know, duality of patterning and productivity and arbitrariness, which, you know, he's not putting these forward as, you know, original claims of himself. He, he's summarizing things because we know that Saussure and others were talking about the arbitrariness of the sign, uh, interchangeability, which of course Benveniste uh, talked about, specialization, displacement, that is you can talk things away from the here and now, cultural transmission, that is you don't just have it transmitted to you uh, genetically from your parents. Yes, 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 to all of these things, you know, with a few little hedges about exactly how arbitrary are things, do you get a bit of iconicity and so on. So I don't think anyone's going to argue with these, but nor do they pin down uh, the amount of variability in languages uh, very much. Now, you have to design a tool according to what its function is. And here I think it's useful to think that the, the way we run linguistics as a field of inquiry or the language sciences more generally depends on what we're studying. And I think it's very interesting that the linguists always seem to have envy of some other field of inquiry. Uh, and the question is, who do you get envious about? So for Chomsky, it's very much physics env envy. Uh, and there's this uh, quite an old book now by Thomas Perry, Evidence and Argumentation in Linguistics, but he mentions this implicit and often actually in explicit use of idealizations from physics. So as soon as there's a little bit of variation, there's a sort of rhetorical move that says something like, oh yeah, that's just like friction. You know, you just, just having friction doesn't mean you don't set up your, your normal rules of momentum and inertia and, and so on, uh, or possibly a bit of chemistry, chemistry of gases or, or something like that. So uh, here's um, Katz saying this explicitly, a linguistic description is an idealization in exactly the same sense in which any scientific theory, such as the dynamic theory of gases or the Newtonian theory of mechanics is. So here we've got chemistry and physics both named. Now, of course, a linguistic description could be an idealization without our notion of diversity being an idealization. That is, you could say, as an intellectual position, we want to write idealized grammars of languages, but they can be organized according to very different principles and categories. Uh, but the tendency in generative grammar was to go one step further and push idealization onto the notion of universal grammar, which in my view was not a necessary part of late 1950s, early 1960s generativism. That is, you could have had a theory of generative grammar which posited the sorts of rules that, that we know and then said, yeah, that's for English. And then you might write another sort of generative grammar for another language, but the categories will be different and the rules will be different and so on. But as it happened, uh, the things went together. So uh, then that article of Thomas Perry goes on to mention um, you know, other, other views of language which uh, take a different, different uh, view of what science is the appropriate reference point, and I'll, I'll come back to that shortly. Okay, so there's another consequence of approach. One is like how much variation is there, but then that also uh, translates to views of how language evolved in the first place. Now, the very title of this course, which has the word evolution in it, uh, sometimes, we're, in which we know, we're in the city where discussions of the you know, original evolution of language were banned. So when was it, 150 years ago, whenever it was, uh, possibly in this room, I don't know, was the Société Linguistique de Paris? Uh, de Paris? Held, so it was probably in this room that that, that ban took place. It's pretty cool. Um, but so, so evolution is sort of ambiguous between like deep time, 
evolution, that is the original evolution of language, and ongoing evolution that we see going on before our eyes in French or English or Chinese, whatever, uh, you can just see these as totally unrelated things. Or you can see them as all part of the same phenomenon, uh, just in the same way that if we talk about maybe modern day evolution in humans, which is still going on, uh, that's the same processes happened as happened with the evolution of early hominins and the evolution of vertebrates and the evolution of however far back you, you want to go. They're the same processes are at play, it's just they're operating on different entities through time. Um, so it's very interesting when you look at what uh, the generativist approach had to do because if you reduce all modern languages to basically very small variations on a single type, it makes it quite hard to talk about initial evolution because you've sort of chucked all of your processes of change out the window. So the famous sort of intellectual move when Chomsky had his essentialist definition of language or origins focusing on recursion as the sole defining criterion of language. That's all that's different between language and something else. And he had this single, this term of saltationist likeness, sort of make a huge e discontinuous evolutionary uh, leap. And even worse, according to uh, what he wrote, uh, you've got the quote here on the right hand side, um, proposed a single saltationist leap with the evolution of language not driven by any selective factors or any communicative role for the development of recursion. So here you've got an evolutionary change without selection, which is not normal view of how evolution works. And here, because uh, recursion is so important, there's this really cute uh, recursive to, to show it recursion isn't solely a property of language. Actually, here's it's a property of photographs. So we've got Chomsky and Halley holding a photograph of Chomsky and Halley holding a photograph of Chomsky and Halley back through time. Um, and Chomsky wrote, you know, it surely can't be assumed that every trait is specifically selected. In the case of such systems as language or wings, uh, it's not even easy to imagine a course of selection that might have given rise to them. A rudimentary wing, for example, is not, in quotes, useful for motion, but is more of an impediment. So it's very interesting. He's sort of getting in bed with the anti-evolutionist uh, end of, you know, fundamentalist Christians and so on who, who think, you know, it's just creation. Uh, you can't get these things. And, and of course, there's plenty of evolutionary biologists who say, well, sure, you just you don't need to have a lot of stuff. And, and the old saying that, you know, 1% of an eye is better than 0% of an eye if you're a tiny little worm and you, know, you want to know where the light is, uh, you're already ahead. Uh, and you just keep uh, making those small incremental leaps. So that's the opposite of the saltationist position. So the alternative, if you take the sort of uh, approach which I'll be arguing for through this course, that is one which really integrates an evolutionary approach uh, all the way down, all the way out, recognising diversity at every level, is that you can then make a, a unified theory of language evolution. And just weeks ago, uh, this wonderful book, uh, from Signal to Symbol came out with MIT Press uh, by my uh, lovely colleagues, uh, Kim Sterilny and Ron Plain, they're shown there in the photograph. Uh, and in the preface to their book, they say that um, any adaptive theory of language evolution must identify a plausible evolutionary trajectory from great ape-like communicative abilities to those of modern humans, where each step along the way is small, cumulative and adaptive, or at least not maladaptive. So they're pushing back this, this very small incrementalist view uh, all the way back. And that leads us uh, just temporarily 
jumping you know, way back in time. That's something I'll return to in the last of our meetings, but to give you a little you know, sneak preview, what I'll call a gradualist assumption that follows very much from that um, Planer and Sterelny uh, view of things, uh, that languages aren't just a single thing. They're not just recursion. They're packages. In this, if you just think about two really important technologies essential to us today, farming or the internet, each one of those assembles a whole number of different innovations. So you, you just go out to a farm somewhere just beyond the Ile de France and, and, and you will see maize from Central America being grown. You'll see pigs, which were domesticated in Southeast Asia, chickens, which were domesticated in Southeast Asia. Maybe you'll still see a horse from the steppes. If people were still using plows, that was they were originally developed in the southern end of the Mediterranean and then plows were brought to the northern Mediterranean and adapted for more heavy soils and you know, many, many other elements, all of which was slowly put together into the modern farming package with its variations from place to place. But if you just said, when was farming invented? Uh, there's not just a single thing there. There's a whole lot of elements. Or you say, well, what about the invention of the internet? Of course, there are a number of steps there. So the original notion of linking computers together across different times, uh, that at that point there was no Wi-Fi, for example, or there weren't browsers or other things. So all of this, and let alone uh, the ability to connect a phone to the internet. So all of that stuff that we now have there, those are all individual elements, and undoubtedly there'll be many more added to them. So I think it's more useful to see language as like that. And um, each package or each element in the package was evolved somewhere or maybe multiple places, multiple times. Uh, and this is the same whether we're talking about like really major architectural principles like compositionality or dual patterning or arbitrariness or the distribution over channels, so what goes in the mouth-ear channel and what goes on the eye-hand channel. If you take a view that language was originally primarily gestural in origin and then with the um, human invention of fire, for example, which then made fireside chats uh, something uh, that became more important, uh, that's part of, of what the um, Planner and Sterelny book argues that would have seen a shift in the division of labour between those two channels, but not everywhere. Because if you are deaf, of course, you, you've stayed in the, um, in the hand-eye channel. Uh, so that's uh, another one. Or, um, uh, and, and then the distribution of semiotic labour. So if you want, wanting to express a, a particular meaning, uh, we know that sometimes the meaning goes into the lexicon, sometimes it goes into the morphology, sometimes into the sy syntax, the same meaning, sometimes into the prosody, sometimes into gesture. Thanks. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, and then how Dakes is, is handled. So, uh, for example, I, I always find it uh, a bit confusing in French and likewise I know that French speakers find it confusing in in English, but that you use, you know, for both this and that uh, in in English. But of course, English just has this and that, and we can go up to languages with ten or fifteen different demonstrative systems. And uh, English used to have that and yon, uh, and I can have that and that, and it's actually very common for people to combine uh, gesture with um, with speech. Uh, so there we've got uh, a different distribution. But then if you have a, a more elaborated set of demonstrative lexemes, then you can reduce the, your dependence on gesture to supplement that. Personal pronouns, likewise. Uh, so these are all things which are in principle independent, right? So uh, for example, uh, where, how you package up, let's just take that word for, for no, 
is independent of what you're doing in the demonstrative space or with your personal pronouns or whether you're doing it by um, the oral channel or, or the visual channel. So they're independent. They could have evolved in parallel in different human lineages. Again, that's something I'll come back to in the last meeting. But if we just think initially that there were probably at least 50,000 hominins walking around talking in some way, which might have been a gesture away at the sort of dawn of our humanity, uh, and that they certainly wouldn't have all spoken the same language then. That's just implausible. You don't get languages in small isolated groups with that many speakers. So there would have been a lot of different groups. That's why I think the, the sort of monogenesis, polygenesis argument is a bit weird. Um, and things could have been invented, if you like, in multiple places. And some of the inventions that we think of as really fundamental, so uh, I already put up, mentioned that, you know, the famous six word orders, SVO, SOV, that doesn't exhaust the possibility space because there's also free word order. And if you look at my home continent, that is Australian, there's actually no language, none of the 300 Australian languages fit comfortably into those six types. We have a continent of free word order. And uh, so you could say the, I don't want to, if I ever say invention, please don't take me teleologically. I, I mean it sort of in terms of identifying a, a function afterwards and saying that function came about through some interesting ways. Uh, but the invention of free, of, of fixed word order to encode grammatical relations is one which did not reach the Australian continent because it wasn't necessary actually. You've got other perfectly good means of discharging that function. And we can see lots of other localised things which aren't found in Indo-European languages, for example. And they said, well, they never reached here. Uh, clicks is one example, tone, lots of, lots of really useful stuff that never made it. Uh, to, to Western Europe. So we want to argue for a view that incorporates language diversity into evolutionary accounts of language. And uh, we've got two central um, challenges actually. One is to show how, if we want to be really ambitious, every linguistic phenomenon, however diverse and unusual it is, we need to be able to show how it evolved, right? which is a much bigger job than just picking out a couple of things that we're used to doing in grammaticalization theory. Uh, and show how they diversify. And, and second, we need to show how the child's mind can learn it and how the adult's mind can use it. And well, the mind plus your whole articulatory apparatus, which is a big job because you're doing it at high speed. You know, you're doing things in terms of microseconds, as we'll see later on. And how that can work for any one of these vast, this vast range of alternative systems. So when we uh, start on that, um, we move language histories back to center stage. So instead of saying, you know, why do you get state X? You say, oh, we get X because, you know, this is dominated by the such and such node of the syntactic tree. Uh, we have to say, you know, how does state X arise? So it puts things like grammaticalization and various accounts, you know, back into central picture. Uh, and just as quite a put at the bottom, I think it's a useful metaphor uh, that we can think of the, this diversity as being reconceptualized from noise to signal. So it's not just friction, not like friction. It's like this is where the action is in terms of what we want to explain and do as linguists. So there's a lot of approaches in linguistics which revel in variability. So I've sort of looked already at the sort of Chomsky approach, which is an idealizing approach, but there's a lot of different um, strands already in place in our field. So in sociolinguistics, variationist approaches uh, from Lebov and all of his successes identify processes of variation, typically of 
individual elements in speech communities. So, so that's really helpful for looking at basically the uh, processes by which uh, variants get fixed in, popula in populations and what the social semiotics of variation is. And then grammaticalization studies are really important uh, as ways of looking at the emergence of structure, typically morphological structure, from use. And a whole host of scholars, Joan Bybee, Ben Heine, um, Tanya Kutova, Heiko Narog, and you know, many, many others, uh, including people who are here today, uh, have, have worked in that. And then a whole lot of cog cognitive and functional approaches like Bill Croft uh, and so on who, who've argued for, for this, including in books on evolutionary approaches. And, and then uh, Salikoko Mufweni, who I'm delighted is here today, uh, has written this really great book on, on language evolution so, some time ago now, which explicitly adopt uh, evolutionary models. So we're not just starting from nothing here. This is something that a swell, I would say, which has been growing in the field for some time. Uh, but I still don't think those approaches do enough to uh, confront the full diversity of human language. There tends to be a concentration on certain rather well-known phenomena, like, you know, how do we get future tense to evolve or something like that, rather than sampling right across the design space. Uh, so uh, I think we, we're left with these issues that um, the world's languages are in fact incredibly diverse. We have this challenge of accounting for how it evolves and um, that will lead us to look for selectional mechanisms of various types, something I'll talk about in the third uh, meeting, which include you know, physiological things, acoustic, cognitive, sociocultural, demographic, system integration, lots and lots of different things which are at play in uh, selecting for this diversity. So I'm sure you've all seen uh, this slide just to remind us of the very long conversation or a very old conversation between biology and linguistics and the actual Correspondence in the days when correspondence means sending letters to each other between Charles Darwin and August Schleicher and uh, drawings which each of them made in articles which they wrote and Charles Darwin actually making a foray into linguistics that is the formation of different languages and of di different species and the proofs that both have been developed through a gradual process are curiously parallel and then August Schleicher pointing out that, you know, actually one of the problems for Darwin at the time was that there were most of the earlier states which he would postulate weren't attested. And at a time when uh, linguists, especially Indo-Europeanists, drew a lot of their evidence from older forms of, of language, Latin and Greek and Sanskrit and Avestan and so on, uh, here were these um, examples where we could uh, go back to, to older things and also to, to reconstructions. So th this was a promising start to a dialogue, but it, it then sort of fell into mutual neglect for, for quite a long time. Um, this next slide is one I, I have uh, my co colleague, another wonderful ANU colleague, uh, Lyndall Bromham, to thank for this slide, uh, which is that Darwinian evolution is a unified theory to explain diversity and language evolution is based on similar uniformitarian principles. So when uh, Steve Levinson and I wrote our article on the myth of language universals, one of the attacks on, on what we said was that we're just getting rid of general laws out of the field of linguistics, uh, general laws which are present if, if you adopt a generative approach and postulate a you know, number of parameters. Uh, our response, I'm not sure we convinced everyone, was that you're just mo you're moving the domain of generality into the processes that generate the diversity rather than the rules that describe the structures. Uh, so here uh, we've got this um, similar uniformitarian principles. That is, there's some number of principles that give rise 
to structures. We, we can't say there's exactly this number, but it's not like millions. It's probably in the hundreds and it, it would be nice to sort of ultimately as, as another goal for our field to say, look, these are all the things we need. So what we find in both is we have mutations, that is the arising of some new form, uh, w whether you're you know, new form of a moth with a different coloration on your wings or an individual who speaks a bit differently to other, possibly because of their upbringing or whatever it may, might be. And then you have microevolution, where you have, say, shifts in the proportion of uh, color, coloration in the wings of moths uh, according to the amount of the color in, in, in the environment um, or in the population. That is the shift in the uh, proportion with which individual forms or structures are used, uh, the sort of thing that Lebovian variationist approaches do. And then what uh, we can call macroevolution in in evolutionary biology, that is, you've already gone off into different species and different genera and, and you know, you've moved up the tree. And for linguists, that means, for example, different languages, different branches, different language families, uh, diversifying at ever more um, remote levels. So one application of evolutionary approaches, which is well known, is to construct phylogenies. Uh, I, not going to really talk much about that in this course. It's a well-known uh, you know, application of evolutionary approaches. So here on, on the left is a, is a phylogeny of Austronesian uh, constructed uh, in a you know, classic paper by Simon Green, Greenhill and Russell Gray. Uh, and then on the right-hand side, something from another article by uh, Quentin Atkinson asking that what was the, you know, Proto um, Austronesian word for, um, can't, can't even read it. Is it sky? I think sky, yeah. Um, so you can apply those principles to individual words and do it. Uh, so those are computational methods that are pretty sophisticated, imported into linguistics and related fields from um, evolutionary biology, especially uh, computational evolutionary genetics. And they're really useful, and you can do a lot of stuff with them. Uh, but we should note some cautions here, because they're, I, the way I see it, they're just a mathematically applied subset of what evolutionary approaches more generally can tell us about phylogeny. So we've had this spectacular growth of studies like this, and they've come up with some you know, really great findings uh, which somehow seem more solid and testable than what we knew before. But actually, of course, very few of the findings are new. Like mostly, but like we already knew about Austronesian. We already knew what the phylogeny of Austronesian was. It's maybe it's a little bit finer now. We can start giving some dates and so on. But it's not like a qualitatively new finding. Um, and that's because the basic ideas were already there. Just as they, you know, we had... Uh, Linnaeus and then we had theories under, under Darwin of um, the trees of the world's living beings uh, long before we had computational genetics. Um, so the, th the point is that I think is really important for us to remember is that they rely on having directly comparable data points across all languages. That's why they skew the domain of inquiry into the lexicon because it's easy to do that with basic word lists. But if you have something that's a really, really weird phenomenon, like chiral modal case, you can't do it because you just have, you know, you say, well, one, give that to chiral, they've got it, no one else has it, what do you do? It's just not very useful. Uh, or when you have things that don't line up very well, uh, where it's not clear that they're comparable, they don't, they don't work especially well either. So that then says, you know, we look for our key under the lamp, uh, but we shouldn't forget that there's a lot of other places in the darkness that other tools of linguistics allow us to uh, look for. So here's just another acute example, I think, of something that evolutionary biologists knew long before uh, computational methods, 
So, uh, and this relies on what linguists would call a shared innovation that is the amnion or amniotic sac, uh, which is one of the uh, pieces of evidence that evolutionary biologists use to show that lizards are more closely related to humans than they are to salamanders. Because with lizards, we share the evolutionary evolution of the amniotic sac, which is a very useful thing, whether you're in, in an egg or you know in the womb. Um, uh, so you know, lizards, armadillos, humans, birds, whoever, we're all in the, you know the amniotic sphere. Uh, whereas poor old salamanders and sharks hadn't invented that uh, yet. So salamanders and other amphibians like frogs and stuff. Okay, so, so that's something that we just know about from looking at morphological structures. And there's lots and lots of other stuff. So for example, if you look at flying animals or swimming animals, so you say, you know, where do wings come from or where do fins come from? And typically you get them by fusing together some bones from an arm structure, but you don't always fuse together the same points of bones. So that's why a bat's wing looks different from a bird's wing uh, and so on, or why a, a, a fin of a dolphin is different from a fin of a shark and so on, because you can look at the anatomy of a fusion and show there was this sort of historically rare event, event that involved that happening, uh, which is just one in a billion, you know, it's a distinctive thing. Uh, but you don't need to have a sort of computational method to do that. Uh, so here are just some examples from uh, phylogenetic linguistics uh, before we leave that part. So first of all, one that's a known thing, that is if you look at, you know, why do people claim that the Afroasiatic languages are a single family? Uh, well, you've got to look pretty hard actually to find uh, shared material, as, as people here uh, know much better than, than I do. Uh, but if you look at the sorts of things that get identified, deep in the morphology, uh, you've got the use of um, doubling a root consonant and inserting the vowel R to form incompletives. So here we've got uh, our example from four of the five uh, Afroasiatic branches, so in Akkadian, you know, Ikbit, Ikabit, and then Tigrinya, Sabara, and Yesabar, and Tuareg. Well, you, you should say this because I, I can't, I'm not so sure of pronouncing it. I mean, uh, it's, it's something like Ifar and Ifar, something like that. Pre excuse my bad Tuareg pronunciation. Uh, and, and then, you know, Idbil and Idabil in Beja, they, they don't have the doubling, but they've got the R. And then in Migama in Chadic, just almost the only language in Chadic, you can sort of dig deep to find this one, you know, Naapile and Naapalla, the same thing. So here, you know, it's a really giveaway little thing uh, there, but that wouldn't make it into one of your typically, typical lists of traits that get used in a phylogeny. And likewise for forming the plurals uh, with, with w uh, here across, you know, four, four of the five branches. So those are common traits. They're not actually technically shared innovations because a shared innovation is always relative to something else. It's as if we were just to look at amniotes, that is, you know, lizards, armadillos and humans, but without, it, without having brought any salamanders or sharks into the equation. But there's an implicit, well, there was something before that, whatever the next branching thing was with Afroasi, where this was, you know, came in at some point. Or maybe it was even further, deeper than that. And if we look at North Australian languages, we're in the same situation, because you'll know that in Australia there are about 300 and 300 languages or something at the time of the European invasion. Uh, and there's been a lot of debate about are these all related or not? And uh, sort of what everyone would accept is that there's one uh, language family or branch, Pamanyungan, that covers seven eighths of the continent and then crammed into the northwest about 26 others, uh, which 
are collectively called non parmenumen but they, that doesn't form a branch. It's just an assemblage of other groups. But then if you actually look at the forms of some of these, I don't know how well you can see them, probably not very well, um, that uh, take two languages, Maong and Nungaboyo, which I'll just... It's probably not super obvious. Uh, well, no, look, I won't even try. They're, they're there. Uh, the point is that they are assigned in Glottolog to completely different families. So from the point of view of Glottolog, these are in different maximal clades. But if you just want to say, he hit me, in Maung you say Ngani Wong, in Wubo you say Ngani Wang, in, and if you want to say she hit me, in Maung you say Ngan Nga Wong, and in Wubo you say Ngani, Wong, Ngani Wang, and he will hit me, put it into the future, becomes Ngan Bani Wu and Ngan Bani Wumana, and she will hit me, becomes Ngan Banga Wu and Ngan Bangi Wumana, and then he was hitting me, comes Ngani Wuni and Ngan Bani Wini. I mean, this is not just, you know, Papa and Papa or something. These are verbs with five morphemes in a row, and each morpheme you can line up. They have very precise forms. The structure is really similar. Uh, and you can build out from there. Uh, and they, these are languages probably with, you know, two, three percent of vocabulary in common. So thanks to the rich and conservative morphology of these languages, I, I would say you, could, you can make a convincing case for the relatedness, not convincing enough to convince Harold Hammerstrom, who's the you know, keeper of Glottolog uh, yet, but, you know, in principle, there are things one can pursue, right? But that, it, I, I just give that example there because I cited that figure of, is it 426 maximal clades uh, in Glottolog? Well, if you then put these together, that starts to bring it down. Uh, and it's just about, I guess, a temporary point we are at in our knowledge, which is very different from other families which really do seem to be completely unrelated. So, um, look, I think I'm going to skip that just because of uh, running behind a bit. So then we, we turn to what's really going to be the main uh, topic of, of this course, which is why languages are so typologically diverse. And we've got this, you know, field of typology, which I know is possibly arguably more strongly represented here in Paris than anywhere in the world, I would say, um, the systematic comparative study of linguistic structures. And our goal as typologists is to chart and systematize the design space at all levels of language, um, discovering what is common and what is rare. But it, it seems to me that it's sort of, typology has been like a family jewels locked away in a cupboard somehow. Uh, that is, it has this, vast potential, it doesn't interest many people who aren't typologists, uh, and, and it can be harnessed to the sort of approaches that I'm going to be talking about in, um, in these four lectures. So we can begin to argue, you know, why does the design space have the properties it does? Why does it stretch out in particular directions? Why is it populated or in some places in sparse in others? I, I think typology has certainly addressed some of those questions. But there are other parts of the questions where we need to bring in a wider range of tools. And same we can ask, why do some parts of the world exhibit um, so much greater typological diversity than others? As someone who works between Australia on the one hand and New Guinea on the others, both areas that are very diverse in terms of numbers of languages, but in terms of typological disparity, Australia is, you know, sort of variations on a theme, more or less. I don't want to downplay it, but you know an Australian language immediately. Whereas in New Guinea, it's really like Eurasia shrunk down into 1% of the world's land surface. So when I gave a course in, at Hillary's invitation, it seems on, only last year, but it was pre-COVID. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's an argument that I, I made there. So let's uh, 
look at this thing of what we can call uh, rara, which, that is rare things, uh, which you know you can just see these as somehow going in this sort of what's that German word? Kuriositeten cabinet, you know this sort of weird thing where you just put stuff and display them. Or you can see them as really revealing, which is what I'm inclined to do. And, and here's uh, Benoit Mandelbrot, who's the father of this idea of the long tail. That is, from lots of phenomena in the world, not just in language, you have a bunching up of some things which are very common, and then you follow this long tail and you get to rarer and rarer things. But those rare things can be very uh, revealing. So uh, the relatively common phenomena they're usually easier to account for in terms of language internal factors like competing motivations, word order correlations, differential cutoffs and hierarchies, some of the things we're familiar from with from uh, linguistic typology. But then how do you account for RARA? That's much harder actually, because often they have to arise as a result of very particular pathways or very particular conditions and what factors lead them to evolve. And is their rarity simply a sampling problem? That is, we, we haven't sampled properly across the world's clades. And uh, I'm just mentioning this idea of a diachronic filter, which you can think of it as sort of a path dependency is another term that gets used. That is, you can only get to certain points by passing through other points. And if those points are, thanks, if those points are already rare, then uh, that's uh, pretty tricky. So, um, I'm just going to, I'm not going to get through everything today, which is fine, but I want to get to a sort of natural point to leave things and then I'll leave a bit of time for questions. So of course we should talk about sexes since that's a good uh, way to talk about the long tail. And, you know, most species have two sexes as we, you know, used to believe for humans. I mean, it's sort of now we're getting some more categories uh, and on some passports and other, you know, toilet semiotic systems and so on, we're expanding out the set. But um, I don't know of any national passports, even in Sweden or toilet systems in Sweden, where you have you know, 20,000 toilet types according to the number of uh, sexes or genders. Um, but if we just think of two as the default, uh, most species have them. There's a few interesting species that have three. So this is one uh, sort of bee species. Queens mate with one type of male to produce future queens and another type to produce future workers. So the queens up there think, well, how, how many? Oh, I'm a bit low on queens. OK, I can go for this fella here and no, I need to bolster up the number of workers. I'll mate with this one here and so on. So it's a useful system. Um, to have, but it's evolved under the very particular conditions of um, hives. And then, this is really wild, some fungus species have more than 20,000 sexes. Um, so you might think, well, are these really sexes, you know? Um, there are genetic regions of their chromosome which I shouldn't depend on, to determine which other individuals they can mate with. So if you've got these particular things. There's, there's more than one region of the chromosome uh, and then you just sort of pick it out. So, so what it does is, I mean, there's lots of interesting sort of population things that you can read about in that nice article by uh, Antonis Rokas. And as well as that, these um, fungus, some other fungus species can change sex according to who to want to mate with. So who's around? Oh yeah, well, want to mate with them, change it to this sex. Again, quite useful. Um, so you could, you could sort of take one view, which have a sort of universal reproductive grammar that says, yeah, two sexes, that's what you got. Um, or you can say, well, yeah, that's a pretty common solution. And there's lots of reasons why most species of, it doesn't matter whether you're you know, a fungus or a bee or a human, uh, two, the two sex solution works pretty well. But sometimes it's adaptive to have three or 20,000. And those are, you know, if we want to understand why species have sexes, we have to understand the answer to that question as well as the question why is two a common uh, solution.
So that will then uh, bring us to comparable questions for linguistics. And I think I'm going to hold this across till next time, but I've got a little bit of time and I'd rather use that to invite your questions in this nine minutes that remains to us. Yeah, en français or in English, whichever you prefer. Yeah. So thank you very much. Nick. Thank you for picking up with uh, into, um, those problems with uh, presentation. So now I would like to ask if the um, public in the chat has questions, but if you do have questions here, please ask them in English or en français. Mm. So Sally Coco, yeah. Okay, thank you for giving me a chance to ask my question. Nick, you did a wonderful job. You, uh, like usually you are on target on issues that deserve a lot of attention. And I'd like to uh, suggest more. Um, that first of all, you connect this with biological evolution in terms of the evolution of humankind. Um, why is it that biologists keep telling us we descended from Lucy as if we just must have had one ancestor that we mm. all share? Second, that representation is misleading because it suggests that you know, it must have been like the birth of Jesus Christ, no mating. Mm. And the other part of it is that um, we, if you look at the fossils of human evolution, they are dispersed everywhere in Africa. And you didn't touch on that because the possibility of polygenesis remains mm. open. Mm. Just for like for yeah. biological yeah. evolution itself to account for different races and different, you know, whatever kind of diversity one want to, wants to focus on, and that's very important. Yeah. But then, so, you know, Sally, before before you go on, can I just answer the first part of it, and then you can come back to the right. others? Because in fact, in my last uh, lecture. I'm going to be talking about something along the lines of what you're saying that is personally I believe in, in what I call polysemigenesis that is the independent evolution of partial languages in many different human groups which one presumes were in different parts of Africa but I wouldn't necessarily rule out that there weren't groups elsewhere uh, like okay. Denisovans and so on. Uh, and that things were pulled in different ways. So that's a topic I'll certainly be uh, returning to um, in the in the fourth of the lectures. Thank you. Then I'll omit the rest of that component mm. of my question. Yeah. Uh, I'll move to something else. Um, the, the notion of proto-language. Now that we are learning more about linguistic areas and genetic uh, Genetics is also telling us about different types of migrations and contacts. I think we're going to need more arguments to stick to the notion of proto-language, you know, and not that it should be trashed out. You take mm. smaller entities such as English diversifying now or Latin diversifying, that's easy. If you take it from the point of view of the exodus out of Africa, how we would have wound up with the proto-languages that we have posited. And already genetics is telling us the notion of proto-Indo-European is questionable. So maybe, you know, given the approach that you are taking, it's also time to trash um, the wedding between linguistics and Newtonian physics and try anchoring your reasoning in terms of emergentism and what's going on. And we will learn much more, especially about those cases of uniqueness that don't fit the proto-language model. 
So, so look, once again, um, Sally Koko, look, thanks for, for putting that into, into the discussion because, uh, of course, just to explain typical approaches which are very tree-based and assume, you know, unique ancestors and so on. It's useful to take that as a point of departure, but it's a very strong idealization of the data. And as you would have seen, I used a little portion of the vertebrate tree. So as far back as we get is, you know, sharks. But if we apply our models to fungi or even more so to vi viruses, basically you start getting more and more horizontal transfer, which then becomes, uh, you know, a better model in, in lots of ways for what's going on in language, uh, including all sorts of interesting contact effects, whether they be creolization or mixed language effects or other forms of contact. And again, towards the end of the course, I'm going to be arguing that it, contact itself is responsible for a lot of the diversification that we find. Uh, I know that contact often gets invoked as a cause of convergence, uh, you know, that languages copy each other's structures in some way, and I don't deny that that occurs, but I think it can also produce a lot of divergence as well. And I'm going to be arguing for that, you know, a bit later on. So um, I hope you'll be there for, for that part. Uh, there's certainly not things which I will neglect. Est-ce qu'il y a des questions dans la salle? Hilary? Thanks for a really fabulous talk uh, and for the, our first shot, our first vaccination against universal grammar. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to ask a little bit along those lines, what's the relation here with, with language to cognitive abilities, which you mentioned during your discussion of the slide with Carter and Sterelmi, mm. and I guess going back to Anna Rashford's theorem, um, this idea that, that, she, that she took up of Leibniz's alphabet of thought. So do you really want to completely eliminate some idea of a basic set of semantic, uh, or not necessarily implies, but some what, lexicon and syntactic structures that might be shared by mm. readers, would that be somehow, I mean, does it have to be incompatible with, with this uh, incredible diversity that you've shown to us so clearly? Yeah. So I think, uh, I mean, the, the place of that approach within what I'd be talking about, it's, it's an interesting question that um, I'm not going to have time to do justice to in the course, but it, it's great that you raise the question because it's a, at least a little space to answer that question. So, mm. oh, was it? No, 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 no. no. Yeah. So, uh, m my view of the current state of play in that NSM, that is natural semantic meta language tradition, with its postulation of some 70 or so uh, semantic primitives is that they're too much inclined to take an all or nothing position. That is, if you look in those 70, there's about 30 which one person or another for one language or another have expressed concerns about. So for me, for example, uh, no, as I discussed, is, is one problem for some languages I know. A want is another one. There are some others, I, I think, you know, this is, is also another one. Uh, so th there are some where I think they should allow things to open up. There are others where they can probably uh, make a very strong case for universality. So I would personally prefer uh, them to have a more gradient approach to membership in that set of primitives. I, I wouldn't regard that as impossible. That is, you, you, you have some building blocks which are really scared and other ones which according to the language you've assembled in different ways. Uh, so that would be my basic way of going about it. But I, I am rather sceptical about the whole program. I just meant that as one example where you were also talking about the sort of basic word lists. I mean, that's, that already assumes oh. some kind of uh, comparability. But you were also telling us that you're very anti-questionnaire. Mm. So does that 
what kind of approach would you take in that well, case? Well, don't believe in a basic one, at least. Uh, yeah. If you're against questionnaires, you're not going to agree with that mm. point of view because it leads to all kinds of biases. Yeah. Data collection, but... Look, I, th I think, you know, they're necessary evils. Like, we, we have to do all sorts of stuff we don't like, like wearing masks or, or whatever. You, know, uh, you, you use imperfect tools for given purposes. And uh, I, I think that the NSM approach ha has tools which are really useful for some purposes. Uh, in fact, a lot of the more useful tools have departed from the original version. So there's the versions in sort of more basic English and so on, which are no longer using NSM. Uh, Swadesh lists, they're still useful, e even though the words don't line up exactly. Uh, they, they, and then there are ways of uh, having more sophisticated versions, which allow for a bit of semantic slippage and so on, which I, I know people are, are working on. So um, I'm not saying that they're not useful for some purposes but I think we should always remember what they don't do for us and what we are idealizing and always think is that a problem or not you know like what are we claiming and did that particular move of idealization dig us into a hole where we don't want to be